I think it's important to understand the copyright laws and to respect them. And it's important to know, not just for your projects that you do here, but your projects that um, you would do in a professional context of what the copyright laws are and the different ways that you can obtain images. All right? It's not all just like take a camera and take pictures. All right? You can buy stock photos. You can uh, hire a photographer. You can look for things that are licensed under Creative Commons. And you can look for uh, things that are in the public domain, even. All right, those are all valid ways of getting pictures. And you can find pictures um, to suit almost all your needs using one, of, one or more one than one of those message, uh, methods. The thing to keep in mind is, as a general rule, the more you pay, the more likely you're to get exactly what you want. All right? That just kind of kind of makes sense. So if you wanted a picture of the autumn, you know, um, and you wanted it to be specifically that tree out there in the courtyard, um, to hire a professional photographer to take a good high quality image would cost a lot of money. If you're not picky about it being that tree, and you just want an autumn scene, uh, or a generic autumn on campus scene, you could probably find a stock photo or something licensed under Creative Commons or in the public domain that, that might be almost as good. So you have to decide what you want. All right. Um, one thing I do want to point out is if you look at the sizes of these images, I didn't keep an original of number one. Um, I do have, I do have uh, the original, all right, so I could pull it back if I wanted to, but I didn't save it in this folder. But if you notice how much drastically smaller it is, it's 89 kilobytes as opposed to 3 megabytes. And that's another reason for resizing images. And that's a reason for resizing images via a photo editor as opposed to CSS. You can use CSS to make an image smaller as well. The problem with that is you're still downloading the full image. And if I had a whole bunch of images, 3 meg versus 89K is a huge difference. And it would add up in the load time of the page. The one thing that I should have done, even though I do own the copyright to this image, is I should have said that somewhere on the page. So let me go into the tutorial and edit it and say images at copy. Remember, we saw those special characters. I'm sorry, not at copy, ampersand copy, semicolon. Mike Zellers. Let's change that to say sunflower image. And if I if it was somewhere on the web, I'd I'd probably put a URL there. Notice I get the little copyright symbol there. All right. Now images are sort of an interesting thing in, on web pages <coughs> in that some images are used for decoration and some images are used for actual content. In other words, we're going to put some images on the page because they're important in telling our story. If I was going to show a, a page about the Browns victory Monday night, I might show a picture of Odell Beckham catching the pass one-handed. That would help tell the story. It's one thing to read, boy, what a fantastic catch was. But if you had a picture, that could tell the story even better. But then there are some things that are just there to sort of decoration, to create a mood, to make it more aesthetically pleasing. So images can be part of the content, or images can be part of just the aesthetics of the page and the appearance of the page. 
So we talked about how to use the image tag. What we're going to talk about now is how to use background images. All right? So let's go and look, and let's find a background image for this page. Let's Google and let's look for pictures of a computer. I'm going to go to advanced. And I'm going to say labeled for non-commercial use. And I'm going to pick this one. And I'm going to copy the URL because I'm going to put that in my footer of this guy. And I could even make that a link if I wanted to. Well, I'm going to save that image. And I'm going to put it in the same folder as the rest of the stuff. And I'm just going to change the name of it to computer. All right, so I'm going to go into the CSS for this, and I'm going to put on the body. Notice how the body has background. There's actually a whole list of properties dealing with the background. <coughs> There's a background color. There's a background image, and so on. So I could write background-color, or for many properties in CSS, there's sort of a shortcut where I only include the stuff up to the dash. So instead of saying background-color, I do what I did here and say just background. Well, guess what? The browser is smart enough to see pound sign FF DAAA. That's a color. So of course you're talking about background color. So even if you don't say background color, if you just say background, it's smart enough to figure out, hey, they must mean background color. And it's similar with image. So I can have a background color, and I can have a background image. And first I'll, d I'll do it with two separate style rules, and then I'll combine them into one. So I could say background color background image. Colon URL. And then the name of the image. And ours is computer.png. So I can save it. And then when I view the page, I get this. Notice I still get my background color underneath parts of the image. Why do I get the background color? Why do I still see the background color? This is my image. Exactly. Parts of the image are transparent. And if I view it in this in this tool, it shows the transparent things as black. If I view it in another tool, 
like maybe if I open this up in the GIMP, which is a photo editing tool, it'll show it as little, like a little gray checkerboard. GIMP, by the way, is a great image manipulation program, and it is free and open source. So if you don't want to spend money on Photoshop, I would suggest trying out GIMP. It is professional quality. Professionals use it um, to do photo manipulation. So I would suggest trying that. And again, this shows it as transparent. All right. PNGs can be transparent. JPEGs cannot have transparent sections. Can GIFs be transparent? That's a good question. I don't remember. Nope, you can't make a GIF transparent. So that is one advantage of PNG files. As PNG files, you can have parts of the image be transparent. JPEG files are good for photographs, and so are PNG files. GIF files are good for things like drawings and something simple, and like logos, all right? Like if you're going to do the Coca-Cola logo or something, there's a good chance that might be in a GIF file. Um, so choose the file type carefully for the image. Uh, if it's a photo, probably a JPEG or a PNG. If you need transparency, make it a PNG. A drawing could be a GIF. All right, so at any rate, this is how page looks. Now, notice that we have a little bit of a problem here in that some of the text is a little hard to read. Simply because there's portions of the image that sort of blend with the text. What can we do to fix that? Any thoughts on what we could do to fix that? We could do a text outline. We could make the text bigger. We could possibly make the text a different color. We could also sort of fade the image a little bit so it looks like a watermark. Let's look at some of those things. We'll do a couple, if not more, of those things. Oh. And also note that because both pages use the same CSS file, just kidding. Well, we'll make sure that both use the same CSS file now. I'm going to try opening these in Google Chrome because I don't feel like troubleshooting something like this. You obviously couldn't do this if you were doing a real project. Just say, well, use Google Chrome for everything. But I can do that here.
and there we go. Not sure why it didn't show in the other browser. This one's even more dramatic. Notice that it repeats the image over and over again. We may want that or we may not want that. And there's ways in the CSS we can stop that from happening if we want. We can do that saying here in the CSS, no dash repeat. Actually, I think like this. And then we only get one of the images. All right. Well, let's make the let's make the text bigger, especially in the paragraph. So I could say B P font size two M. Well, that helps, but kind of doesn't help. Could make it bold. Helps a little bit, and so on. Uh, I'm going to go and I'm going to fade the image. I'm going to fade the background image to accomplish this. So I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to put my credit in the footer. And then I'm going to fade the image. Now, we can fade the image using any number of image editing software. My suggestion, if you have not done this before, is play around with GIMP. So I'm going to open this up. Now, again, we would have to verify that the Creative Commons license applies to making derivative works. I'm pretty sure this one said it did. So I'm going to open this uh, up in GIMP. And I'm going to fade it out. Fade it out usually involves making the contrast higher, or I'm sorry, lower. And maybe making the brightness higher. So if I do that, we can almost barely see it there. But when it's on the page, we'll see it just sort of a faded version of this. I'll go up here and overwrite it. And yeah, I don't know if I like that. Let's undo that. Let's instead up the brightness of it. And maybe decrease the contrast just by a little bit. I decreased the contrast so much that it changed the orange portions of the screen to just gray, which, which was a little, taking a little too far. So now I'm going to overwrite it again. And there, that looks better. And we're getting to the point where it's, it's a lot more readable. 
Now there's another thing that we could do, is we could put backgrounds on the different elements of the page so that the image sort of peeks from behind stuff. So just like we have a background on the header there, I could put a background on the nav, I could put a background on the paragraphs, and so on. So I could do something like this and say paragraphs background white. All right. And then we don't have the problem, at least with the paragraphs, because there's a white background to contrast against. And I could do the same thing with the nav if I wanted to. So I've gone and I've made this a little more readable. Another thing I could do that would be a little less drastic is I could make the, um, I could change the opacity of the paragraph in that. So it was sort of see-through. All right. So let's look at how we change the opacity of something. It's a property, and I can say 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is like half see-through, half solid. And that made it sort of see-through. That helps with the reading a little bit. Maybe we'll up that just a bit. We'll make it 0.7. Oh, All right. That way you can sort of see the image behind, but you can read the text a little bigger. It is. We could we could do that. We could. That's a good good suggestion. Let's try that. Yep. Let's do this just to show the difference. We'll do it on the paragraph and leave the One twenty-eight. Okay, let's try that then. Good solution. That faded the background but kept the text at normal darkness. Okay. Another thing that you do sometimes is if you remember before I went and put the no repeat, it repeated the image. It's going to tile the image. All right. Think of the tiling of the image as being like the floor tiles that, that you might have at home or you might have seen at home. Where if you have a, a, a pattern, it's going to repeat both horizontally and vertically. And you can, you certainly can change off whether it repeats both horizontally and vertically, but you can also allow it to repeat. All right? I promised I was going to change this to only have one property. The equivalent of this would be to do this. Then you just say background. 
and the browser is smart enough to figure out this must be the color, this must be the image, this must be the repeat property. And it will work the same. Okay. You can find all sorts of background panels <coughs> that are like tiles. If you ever notice your, your tiles like in on the floor, they have a pattern so that when you stack them next to each other, a bigger pattern is made. So for example, an individual tile like this. All right. But when you stack other tiles, it forms a bigger pattern. Like that. So there's no circle in that tile. When you put the four tiles together, it forms a circle there. All right? So there's a lot of CSS background tiles that we can use. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save all this stuff, and I'm going to make another copy of this, and I am going to use a background tile instead. So I'm going to make a new folder here. Version 1. Put all these guys in here. Rename this one to version 2. Then I'm going to go out looking for CSS background tiles. This looks like a good site. Save that image. I'm call it tile. So I'm going to go in my CSS and I'm going to say body background. I'm going to get rid of these colors because we're going away from that color scheme. And I'll say background tile.png. Now if we look at this, oh, I forgot to take out the no repeat. All right, we have that, and it forms that sort of picture. Now, we could, again, we could probably play with the colors of the font, maybe make the font bigger, whatever. But I'm going to show you something that is done a lot of times when you have a background tile. Because a background tile is a little different than when you have a picture of a sunflower or a picture of a computer where you want the person to see 
that picture, you know. A tile is sort of okay if the tile sort of just frames the content. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a very quick design that centers all the content and allows for the tile to just peek out around the edges of the content. So I'm going to go into the CSS file and I'm going to define a style rule for the header the nav section and footer I think that's all the things that we have in our web page oh and I'm going to change the credit on the bottom of the page to reflect the new place where we got the image from. All right. Now my style rule is going to say for each of these, I'm going to say background white. And I'm going to build this a step at a time. Background white. All right, so now we have that. Why isn't that white? I forgot to put the little thingies there. And again, notice what the browser did. It thought the rest of this stuff was the nav style rule, so it didn't do anything for the section or the footer. I'll bet you that's article, not section. There we go. All right. So notice how that's sort of peeking out, all right, behind the background, uh, the white background. Now, that's okay, but if we want to make this look a little better, It'd be really cool if this didn't go all the way across the page, if we allowed for a little bit more of that tile to be seen. So we can do that with the width attribute. I'm going to get rid of that. And I'm going to say width 600 pixels. Now, 600 pixels is individual pixel is like a dot on the screen. Your screen is a collection of dots and there's like about a thousand dots going across this particular screen. So 600 would be about 60 percent. I can also use percentages by the way and we'll talk about that later but for now I'm going to use 600 px to make this always be 600 px. And I forgot to save it. I'm having a tough time today. It's a long week. There we go. All right. Kind of looks out of balance, right? Kind of looks like it should be centered. So I can easily 
center this by doing the following. Margin 0px auto. I'm going to do this. I'm going to show you the result, and then I'll explain why it works that way. For certain attributes, there's actually four of them. <coughs> margin is the space between things on the page. So if I have one thing on the page and another thing on the page, we have four margins. We have the space above the thing, we have the space to the right, the space below, and the space to the left. That's four margins. I can give a value for each of the margins. I could give a top margin of 15 pixels, 20 pixels, 5 pixels, 30 pixels. And I could actually specify in my style rule margin right, margin dash right, margin dash top, margin dash bottom, margin dash left. But as we saw before, I can also give a shortcut. And that's what I'm doing here. I specify margin and I give values. Now I've given two values and there's four. All right. The way that it works is if I give four values, the first value is for the top, the second is for the right, the third is for the bottom, the fourth is for the left. If I only give two values, the first is for the top, the second is for the right, the third is for the bottom, and the fourth is to the left. So I've specified a right margin of zero pic or a top margin of zero pixels. The right margin to be automatically calculated to center it. The bottom margin to be zero pixels and the left margin to be automatically calculated to center it. So, that's why we have the way this looks. All right? Questions about this? What if I want? Yeah, go ahead. Repeat that, please. To link the CSS to the web page? Yeah, you put in the web page this line. It's in the head section. No problem. Now, notice there's still a little gap between them. I should be able to get rid of that by saying in the CSS, star margin zero. That says, by default, just give everything a zero margin, except where I override it. And that smushes everything together that way. I can then put other stuff in there to space it out a little bit more. So if you want to do that by default, just add the 
doesn't have to be the beginning, but yeah, you put the star margin zero. Yeah, when you define it, it cascades. So we had talked about that. When it's closer, like the star over closer is a star is is more specific or closer to this content than the style rule for body or the style rule for all tags. Now, another thing I can do is put padding on these things. So I can go in, and padding is the gap between the edge of the content and where the content starts. So I can go in here and say padding four pixels. I only give one number, so it's four pixels all the way around. Top, right, bottom, and left. All right. So that's starting to space it out a little bit. Now, let's, let's make it even bigger. Let's make it 14 pixels. Now, some of you used breaks, break tags, in your code, and I said don't use break tags. We'll learn how to do it in CSS. Essentially, margins would be how you do it with CSS. So you could do a margin bottom and give extra space. Okay. And there's kind of what I'm looking for. Questions about this? Other CSS properties we could play with. We could play with the font family. I could say font family. And we use the Georgia font for this. When we specify fonts, we specify typically more than one. The reason for this is remember that each machine has a different set of fonts installed. So therefore, if I had a machine that did not have the Georgia font installed, it would go to the next font in the list. And the next font in the list in this case is the generic serif font. Because every browser is going to have a generic serif font. Do you know the difference between a serif and a sans serif font? Let's open up Word. Exactly. Exactly. Let's go into Word and let's... Type in a letter, a few letters, and, and we'll see, is it a serif or sans serif font? So let's make it Arial. Let's make it really big so you can't miss it. So I type in an A in Arial. Is that a serif or a sans serif font? It's sans serif. All right. Why is it a sans serif? Because you don't have the little things on the top and the bottom of the letters, little foot, feet. Let's change it to a different font that is serif, like Georgia. And I type in the letter A. Notice that the end of the letter has those little thingies. Those are called serifs. So serif fonts have those little thingies. Sans serif fonts don't have those little thingies. All right? So when I give a list of fonts, <coughs> I'm going to give as many fonts as I want to, and the browser will first try to use the first font, then try to use the second font, then try to use the third font, until it finds one that is installed on that machine. That's why you end in serif or sans serif. Because 
every browser will have a generic serif or sans serif font that you can rely on. So, let's make up some fonts that I know I'm not going to have. The XYZ font, the ABC font, and then I'll say sans serif. Now, those fonts I know aren't installed on this machine because I just made up their names, all right? So, it will go and use a generic sans serif font. But if I had one that it did have, horrible but at least you, but at least you see the difference what what are some what are some factors in your decision about what fonts to use pardon me okay all right so how would you decide if, if I said you have to do a web page for this topic? How would you decide? Give, okay. So let's say it was a serious news site. What font would you use? Times New Roman, all right? Or some sort of, of font, all right? And I think you're hitting on exactly the point. The font is almost like colors. Remember, we do use colors for a couple different things. One is to set the mood, all right, to sign a, kind of subconsciously set the mood. Could you imagine if you went to a uh, website that was supposed to be a news website and the font was Comic Sans? It, it would lose its credibility somehow, even though the content could be exactly the same. You'd have a hard time taking it seriously. But you also do it for readability. All right. A mix that generally works pretty good is to have headings in a serif font. I'm sorry, head, yeah, headings in a serif font and ordinary text in a sans serif font. So you'll see that a lot. Let's go to the Wall Street Journal website. And they made a liar out of me. This uses, well, this uses serif fonts here, and the smaller type is in sans serifs. Generally speaking, the smaller, the smaller the type, the more likely it's going to be sans serif, whereas bigger things like headings will be a serif font. So you do it to make it more readable. Readability and sort of the mood or the atmosphere of the page would help you decide what fonts to use. I'm going to leave it with this ugly font just so that we can see an example of it. Um, we'll pick up on our next topic next time. All right. I think, could be wrong, I think our next topic is going to be to talk about the portfolio and the project. So be sure by... Monday of next week, you've read through the sections about the portfolio and the project. Okay, I'm going to, uh, that's all I had. We'll see you up in lab.
If you have something that you finished, turned in, let me know, and I'll grade it. All right, we'll see you up in LAM.